Okay, today's episode has the word champagne in the title, so you can pretty much guarantee this is going to be a good time. My guest is Kara Allwill, a New York City-based creative entrepreneur who encourages women to live their most effervescent lives, celebrate themselves every day, and make their happiness a priority. She is the author of not one, but nine best-selling books, including the worldwide sensation Girl Code. She is a mentor to women entrepreneurs, and she's also the creator of the Champagne Diet blog. This was seriously one of my favorite interviews to date, and I know you're going to love it too. So grab a glass of your favorite bubbly beverage and let's dive in. Welcome back to the show. I have such a treat. At least it's a treat for me, and I think it's going to be a treat for all of you as well. Kara, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Lindsay, for having me. I'm so excited to be with you. Yes. Well, I was telling you before we started to record, we we were connected through our mutual friend, Lori Harder, and I've, I've been a fan of your work ever since your book, Girl Code, which we'll get to in a moment, but truly ever since I found out you had a blog called The Champagne Diet. Because anyone who knows me knows that that's pretty much synonymous with my brand. So I knew we would get along and now it's finally official. We're getting to meet and connect. Yeah, champagne brings pretty much everyone together, I think. <laughs> it really does. So I actually would love to start there. I think this is a, probably a great way to start to frame your story and how you came to do the work that you're doing today. Um, I love how you, you talk about creating your champagne life, but take us back to the blog and how that really was the catalyst for starting the career that you have today. So I started my blog, The Champagne Diet, 12 years ago. So my story starts back in around 2008, early 2008. I was working my full-time job at MTV, and I was in digital advertising. So when I tell people I worked at MTV, they think it was much more glamorous than it really was, (laughs) but it really wasn't. I was a digital ad trafficker, and it's about as boring as it sounds, but I was good at what I did. You know, I think like a lot of us have found ourselves or finding ourselves kind of in our twenties in this moment where like, is this all that there is? You know, we get trapped in these corporate jobs and they pay well. At least I was making good money at the time. I was good at what I did. I had a team under me, but I really just felt like there's gotta be more, you know, I didn't feel like I was fully expressing myself creatively. I didn't feel like I was reaching my potential. And the way champagne came into my life is because I was unhappy at the job, but I didn't really know what was quite off. I was in a relationship that wasn't good for me. I was not healthy. I wasn't treating my body well. And I turned to one of my coworkers and good friends, Lauren, and I said, you know, I think I'm just going to go on a diet. I have to lose weight. I'm so unhappy because that was what most of us think is going to solve all of our problems, right? Right. And, you know, she, she's super fit. She has like this great body. She eats really well. And she looked at me and she goes, okay just start eating healthy. Like don't go on a diet. Don't do anything crazy. Just start eating healthy. Like I'll, I'll take you food shopping. I'll tell you what to eat. I'll tell you how I eat. And I said, okay. Um, can I drink champagne? And she looked, no, no, no. I said, can I drink? And she looked at me and she said, yes, just drink champagne. And I was Sold. like, okay, <laughs> like done and done. Now I, I typically ask people, can I have champagne on this food plan? But back then I had never, I was not a champagne drinker. I mean, I drink like cocktails, like beer, whatever you drink when you're in your twenties, like going to like dive bars, you know? And I looked at her and I was like, all right, like I'm in whatever, you know, whatever you say is going to work. And she's like, well, champagne only has 90 calories in a glass and it's like a really sexy drink. And, you know, you can have one or two glasses and like be good to go. So we went out that night. I'll never forget it. We went to our local bar. We had like some client happy hour and I ordered a glass of champagne from this like total dive bar, you know, in the middle of Times Square, New York City. If you've ever been there, you, you can only imagine the way they gave me a look like champagne. And I, I had this glass in my hand and I had this epiphany. It's a moment that I will never forget 12 years later. And I was holding this glass of champagne thinking, wow, like I feel different in this moment. I feel so elevated. This feels fancy. This feels intentional. This feels different for me. And even like when he served me the glass, everybody's like, Oh my God, what are you celebrating? What's a special occasion? And I started to incorporate champagne as my drink of choice whenever I'd go out. And I started to really 
kind of draw these comparisons about what my life was like and what I wanted it to be. So champagne essentially became a metaphor for me to make a long story short. I completely transformed my life. I got out of the relationship. I got promoted in my job. I started writing. I started losing weight and treating my body better. You know, I was eating like fast food, three meals a day, working 12 hours. So, you know, I started really eating healthy, working out. And I just, I started documenting it and it became a blog and it was a very tongue in cheek title called the champagne diet. Cause it kind of was in a weird way, an actual champagne diet, although it's totally evolved past that. Um, and I, I mean, I still drink it to this day and I love it. And it's just, it's, it's meaningful to me. It's more than a drink. You know, I tell people, even people who don't drink alcohol, even if you just put like sparkling water in a pretty wine glass, if you elevate the every day, it really makes a difference in the way that you feel. Yes. Oh, well, I love it even more for the symbolism behind it. And, you know, it's, it's such a metaphor too, for what we talk about in this community about like really, yes, going after those big goals, but taking the time to stop and celebrate the in-between moments, the moments that don't seem like they're that earth shattering, but it really leads to our true purpose or what we think we're chasing in the first place. So I love it. I love it so much. Now I'm going to, I'm just going to like, gives me even more of a reason to drink champagne on the daily. I feel like we really should have set that up and had a glass during this interview. I know we should have next yeah, time, <laughs> next time, next time. So how did the blog then evolve into becoming an author? You're actually an author of nine books. Um, we're going to talk about the most recent book in a moment, but the book that really put you on the map was girl code. So talk about that process and were you expecting it to become like this worldwide phenomenon? No, not at all. And I think that's why I did, to be honest with you, yeah. because I didn't have any expectations around it. I was just following my heart. So I knew I wanted to be an author. I mean, from the time I was in like third grade, second grade, I was writing books in school, making my own stories up. And I always knew that I wanted to write, but I didn't really know how that was going to happen or what form that was going to take. I thought maybe I'd write fiction, but I really had no idea. But when I started the champagne diet, I felt like there is a place for my story. There is a space for me. I started like dipping my toes in personal development. I read the secret, you know, like very basic kind of stuff. I was really just learning about manifesting and law of attraction. And I was looking around and I was realizing that there was nobody like me in our industry at the time, right? Like there was nobody that liked like Chanel or drank champagne or loved the color pink. Everything felt very um, stiff to me and everything just felt, I don't know. It just didn't feel like I, I vibed with it. So I really started looking for ways that I could sort of represent, you know, the woman that I was and, and talk to the girls like me out there who were going through hard times with the relationships or, you know, career changes, women in their twenties and thirties who wanted different kind of lives. And I, I knew that the storylines that I was writing about in the blog could become a book. So I started the process of writing and that in and of itself was like, so much work involved and so much research. I always say I went to Google University and learned everything that I knew from the internet. And I got a literary agent for my first book, um, which at the time I think we were calling it the Champagne Diaries. I mean, these things like change shape so much over yes. time as you write yeah. a book, you know? Yeah. And I had an agent and we started shopping the book around. This is probably like 2010, 2011. And the book got rejected not once, not twice, but 19 times. So I didn't even know there were 19 publishers Same. and here I am getting re rejected by 19, 19 people. And at that moment, you know, she was kind of losing steam. I was losing steam, but I was also reading up on the self-publishing industry, which was changing rapidly at the time. And for everybody who's listening right now, please Google this blog post from Seth Godin because this blog post changed my life and I recommend everybody reads it. It's called Reject the Tyranny of Being Picked and Pick Yourself. And that blog post, like I get chills when I talk about it because it was so empowering for me. And it was right at the time where people were starting to put themselves out there. You know, JK Rowling was, you know, writing, she had been rejected so many times and she put herself out there. There were other authors that I was just learning about that had, you know, decided to just, you know, I, I think it was like the time of 50 shades of gray. Do you remember like yeah. that whole phenomenon? She self-published, she was earning like millions of dollars. Like there were just so many stories of sort of like these underdogs that wound up kind of, mm -hmm. you know, rising above by choosing themselves. And I was really moved by that. And I decided to self-publish and I self-published a book that I called Sparkle in 2012. And then I wrote three more books and then Girl Code was actually my fourth self-published book. So a lot of people think it was the first book I wrote, but it was really the fourth book that I wrote. 
And at that point I had built like a little bit of an audience, you know, Instagram was like fairly new at the time. There wasn't a lot of people on there. I mean, it was, it was picking up traction and picking up steam for sure, but I was working with what I had. And I just, I don't know what it was about that book. If it was like the message was starting to, you know, get out there about women empowering other women and collaboration over competition. I was kind of like right at the cusp of that movement, I think. And it just caught on like wildfire. And that, I think that most people know me from Girl Code at this point, you know, and they've kind of stuck with me since then. Well, and you have, you've gone on to do so much more. Um, I, so one of the things that really impacted me, um, we're going to talk about Girl on Fire in a moment. That's your latest book. The story you told in the beginning about getting the message from the woman in Iran, having read the book, talk a little bit about, because this, I'm going to set some context and I want to hear your perspective, but, you know, we talk in this community about getting out of your own way, getting into action around these ideas that we're gifted with. And I love, I think coupling that with the message of choosing yourself, which we'll go a little bit deeper into is so powerful because you never know the impact that that's going to make. I think we start doing a project for one reason and then we end up realizing it's going to impact people that we will never meet and maybe even never get to hear about what, maybe share the story of the, this letter that you received. And then what was that moment like for you as the creator? Yeah. So, you know, I wrote girl code from my little dining room table in my Brooklyn apartment, probably in pajamas or like yoga pants, you know, it was, there was nothing glamorous about it. I was just really pouring my heart out. I wrote the book the, right after I had quit my job in MTV. So it was like 2014 going into 2015. And I didn't know what was going to happen. It was really, the book was really just about my experience becoming an entrepreneur full time, meeting women in my industry and in our industry who, you know, came across as, you know, collaborative, but then really weren't. And I started finding women who were really supportive and I knew that I wanted to be more like them. And I wanted to surround myself with women who really lifted each other up. So that was really the only intention just to share my story through the book. And the book wound up selling, oh my gosh, I think it sold like over 50,000 copies in its first year, like independently, wow. just me self-publishing on Amazon. And I share the number because I want people to know what's possible for them. I mean, to me, I think that's like actually like a small number now. I'm like, wow, like anyone out there can like really do whatever they want to do. Anything's possible. Right. So I, I share it because I think it's important to really let people know, um, that that was a big, you know, move from me. And at that point, Penguin Random House came along and noticed that, you know, the book was doing really well and they offered me a double book deal. So we republished girl code, which wound up kind of getting out there. And I think we, it's now in like seven or eight languages it's been translated into. But what's interesting about the Iranian translation is that one day I was sitting on Instagram and I got this message from this woman in Iran and it was a copy of girl code that had been translated. And I, I obviously I couldn't understand what it said, but she wrote to me and she's like, you know, I don't speak very well English, but I just want to let you know that I found this in the library and you know, it changed my life and it gave me hope and it made me feel like I could do things that I was told I couldn't do as a woman in my country. And I was like, my mind was blown. And I remember I reached out to my publisher and I was like, is this authorized? Like, I didn't know the book was in Iran. And they're like, no, it's not. Wow. Wow. So this woman, I actually wound up finding the translator. She reached out to me and she, she was like, I'm sorry. I hope you don't mind that I did this. And I, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't make any money off of it. I don't care. Like if that's not my intention, like I'm happy, like put it out there, you know, in in as many places as it can go. Cause it's about the impact over I would say impact over income. Of course, we all want to make money. We deserve to be paid for our work. But in this circumstance, it was so unique that it didn't matter to me. You know, it was just knowing that something that I wrote by myself and self-published alone could reach like another world, like literally another world. It's just, it's just crazy when you think about what's possible. Like the hair on my arm is literally standing up hearing you share it. It's crazy. Crazy. But what I, what I, really wish more people would have shared with me when I was at that point of like sitting at my dining room table, writing a book or at that, those beginning stages is you don't get to see the, the certainty that those things will happen. You just have to trust that if this idea or this, this prompting to write or create is put on your heart that you have to trust that it's going to reach the people it's meant to reach. It's yeah. crazy. And you will have those stories too when you when you really put those things into action. Um, that is such a cool story and such a good example of exactly what can happen when you get out of the way and allow these messages to come through. I love that. Yeah. And, yeah, and I think like just not getting caught up in the ego, right? Like sometimes yeah. we're so 
get in our own way because we're like, oh, I don't want to look stupid. I don't want to fail. I don't want to be rejected. But you have to put all of that aside. You know, I'm sure there are people that didn't like Girl Code. I'm sure there are people that it didn't resonate with. You can read all the reviews on Amazon. There's good and bad. But for the people that it did resonate with, it's worth it. You know, so you just really have to remove that critic self-criticism out of the way so that you can, you know, serve the greater good and, and really like, you know, own up to your mission in the world, whatever that is. Yeah. Has the self-criticism along the way gotten easier for you now as you've put more work out there? Does it get easier every time? It gets easier. It does because you start to have so many experiences where in the beginning when you get the first bad review or the first weird comment, you're like, oh my God, my life's falling apart. And then like, you just realize like you bounce back from it quicker, yeah. you know, yeah. and you have to kind of just like understand that it's going to come with the territory. But again, the positive messages are just so much more powerful to me now. And I actually, I suggest this to a lot of people and it really helps. I have a little folder on my phone, a little digital folder called love letters. And when I get a nice comment or an email, I screenshot it and I put it in there. So the days when I do feel bad or I do get a weird comment or review, I just go back and I read them and I'm like, you know what? Celebrate the people who celebrate you. That's just what it comes down to. You know, the rest, it's just not your business, frankly. It's not your business. It's their opinion. Everyone's entitled to an opinion. But if you can really just go where you're loved, I think that really just changes everything. I love, I actually have a love folder on my phone too. The exact same reason. It's so important, right? Doesn't it make a difference though? It makes the biggest difference. Even, listen, yeah. even if the first messages in there are from your mom, put them in there because exactly. you know it's going to, it'll build from there. Oh my gosh. I love totally. that. Totally. Love or write one to yourself, you know, sometimes yeah. you have to pat yourself on the back and give yourself credit and be like, wow, you're really, you're doing well. I think now, especially in, in this time where the world is literally upside down, like we're, we're doing our best. We're showing up every day, you know, where somebody said something about, oh, you're not working from home. You know, you're in the middle of a pandemic and now a whole crisis and you're trying to work <laughs> from home. Like life yeah. is is insane. And like, you really just need to realize that, you know, you are doing something that I think, you know, whatever you're doing in the world, however you're showing up, you're doing it in a way that's, you know, only you're, you're doing your best basically. Yes. I had, I interviewed a friend on a former podcast who said, and I had never heard it said this way. She said, everyone is doing their best, but everyone's best looks different. And so that true. was like such a mic drop because it, it is true. And I, I think we're all as women guilty of at one time or another comparing our best to someone else's and it's just not the same. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I could go on and on that trail, but I want to talk a little bit about Girl on Fire. So if you're watching the video, you can see how even it's just so beautiful. And oh, I actually, keep, I keep the book on my desk. I'm right now um, in the middle of writing my second self-published book. And I keep books like yours from women who Yay. inspire me right on my desk as I'm writing. So it's been here. It's been a faithful Aww. sidekick. But um, what's in it is a message I think every woman, in, especially if you resonate with our podcast, if you've loved the things that we share on Powerhouse Women, you really need to read this because it sums up, I think, how well, we talk about getting in your own way. It sums up a lot of the ways that that tends to manifest. So we touched on the Seth Godin blog that really made all the difference for you. Talk a little bit more about what it actually means, what it looks like in real time for a woman to choose herself, to not sit around and wait to be chosen or deemed worthy. What are some of the ways that that can show up in our world? Well, I think the first step is just deciding that the life that you want and the life you desire is available to you right? It's just, it's simply getting into the mindset of if, you know, if she can have it, I can have it too. If it's out there, if it's a dream on my heart, it's possible for me, right? So making that decision first and foremost, and realizing that that decision doesn't just mean that you've now, you know, flipped a switch and everything's going to just happen beautifully. It means that now mm -hmm. this is where you have to put in the work. I think the second part of it is just the execution piece. And with that comes not looking around at everyone else and, paying too much attention to what's going on because that's a slippery slope of comparison and feeling like, you know, someone, like you said, everybody's personal best looks different, right? So getting into a mindset of executing, you know, little by little, whatever that looks like and not letting the fear of failure or past failures get in your way. You know, I think a lot of times we look at, you know, ways that we've been rejected or we failed. And, you know, I really believe that rejection is redirection. And I think that it's wherever we land, we have an opportunity to make that the best place that we've ever been. 
You know, so if you wind up in a situation like I was in where I was rejected by 19 publishers, I could have said, well, this just isn't meant for me. This just, I'm not meant to be an author. I'm not good enough, but I chose to make the most of it and just, and do it on my own. And I learned so much. Like I'm actually now in retrospect, I know that was the best thing that ever happened to me because it forced me to really figure it out on my own and step up to the plate. So, you know, not looking around at others, executing, focusing on those baby steps, you know, every little bit counts. I think a lot of my clients come to me and they want to write books and they have it in their head that it's like so impossible and so hard to write a book. And I just tell them, it's just another way of delivering your content. It's just like writing a blog. It's just like putting out a podcast or an Instagram post, but it's shifting your mindset into understanding that anything is possible for you if you want it bad enough. So showing up, facing those fears, facing those rejections, facing those moments where maybe somebody does doubt you. You know, I've had a lot of people doubt me in the past. I've had people say it to my face. I've had people say it behind my back. And I just, I, I don't know, to me now it's fun. It's like, okay, you tell me no, now watch me make it happen. You know, like, so like, just only you, you have a vision for yourself that nobody else is ever going to understand, right? Like, I think everyone listening right now has a vision, has a very specific vision And they've been given that vision, whether you believe in God, the universe, a higher power, they've been given that vision because it's meant for them to execute on. It's meant for them to experience and live out and fulfill. So I think the more that you can just root your belief in that and know that whatever comes to you is what's meant to come to you, um, it's just easier to move forward. It's almost like you, you have to, it's like your responsibility, right? To show up in the world in the way that you're meant to show up. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm listening to all of that. I'm, I'm envisioning just the, (laughs) the retweets on everything you just said, because (laughs) it's the thing that it's so easy for me even to talk about until I'm blue in the face on the podcast. And then when I'm in the shoes and this is what I really want everyone to know, I still feel the, but what ifs, but you know, what if no one listens? What if no one reads this book? Have you had to overcome that for yourself too, along the way? Oh my gosh. Yes. Girl on fire. That book took me over a year to write because I was dealing with all of this, these blocks, all of the fears, all of those feelings. Yeah. And I remember thinking, do I have anything left to say? Do people care? Was girl code my one hit wonder? Is that the thing that people are just going to care about? Am I ever going to be seen as someone else, as someone, you know, who has done anything more? And like, do I have anything else of value to add? You know, and I really struggled with that. And I knew I did deep down, but these were just like the mean girl voices coming up in my head. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think we all deal with it. We just move through it quicker, you know, and it was a very emotional process for me. Like I really had to just sit down in front of the computer and just put it all out there and write and rewrite. And the book took so many different forms but the way that it came out, like, I'm just so proud of the fact that I had to go through all of those things. And I struggled with it so much because I think the end result was just that much better because it was so raw and so vulnerable for me to share. Yeah. I love that you're sharing so much of this behind the scenes of what it does look like. Cause I think whether someone is writing a book or creating any new thing, putting themselves out there, it, the feeling is similar. The struggles are similar. So what is, what is something that you wish people really got a chance to see behind the scenes of your journey? So much time alone. Like the time that you spend as an entrepreneur alone in your own head, even if you have a team, I have great people that work with me and, you know, I have great friends and family who listen to me, but you really are in this on your own. And it really is. I mean, it it will wake you up at three o'clock in the morning. It will, you know, keep you uh, like, it'll, it would just, I think it's something you can't really explain unless you go through it. You know, and I think again, people who are listening to you and your podcast know what that feeling is, but it's just such a lesson, I think, in personal growth and in confidence and in learning to kind of like combat those fears. And I I don't know, I think it looks, everybody's life looks very glossy on the outside. And I actually think now this time in quarantine has kind of proved that that's just all been stripped away and everyone has to really show up as their purest self. (laughs) the lashes are gone. The hair is gone. The champagne dinner dates are gone. You know, we're just left with like ourselves, but it's, it's a good thing. Cause I think it's showing the reality of what life really is, especially as a business owner, especially as an entrepreneur. So yeah, I think I want more people to realize that even with like, you know, the Instagram filters and the beautifully curated feeds and everything that we see in the wonderful books and podcasts and content, women still struggle. Women who are, you may see as more successful than you are still struggling. They're still dealing with their own you know, insecurities and questions and issues. And it's totally normal. Like it's okay. You know, it's, 
it's not a permanent place. So we don't get stuck there, but it happens. And that's just part of the process. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for being willing to share vulnerably that it, you still go through it too. It's, it's so important for any of us who are, who have platforms who are leading the way in any, even if we're leading one person to be really honest about that, because every single person that you look up to right now is going through it too. And you need to know that. Oh my gosh. So I, I started, thank you. Yeah. And I'm, I love to share this stuff. I've started more projects and I've actually like followed through with them and gotten to a point at the very end before launching them where I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. You know? And like, I've had to really yeah. sit down with myself and be like, why don't I want to do this? Is it because you really just lost interest or because you don't think you can, you know? So we all deal with this a couple of weeks ago. I wanted to just delete my entire Instagram and just like, like forget about everything because I felt so overwhelmed. Like we, yeah. I have these crazy thoughts just like everybody else. Like we're all in it together, no matter what's going on. Right. No matter what year we're in, whatever climate we're in. Um, it's normal, but I think you just have to, I've learned to really like be less reactive about things and really take a step back and sit with my feelings a little bit more because I'm like the very high energy kind of anxious, passionate person. And that can like really kind of go the wrong way. Sometimes if you let it like a runaway train, like the thoughts can just take you to a place you don't want to go. So learning to just take a step back, take a deep breath and like reassess, I think is so important. And with that comes unplugging, pausing, taking those moments for yourself, which is also super important. Yeah. And how has, we, we talk a lot about ha the power of community, having a community of women who are kind of on that same path, who know how much it sucks when you're up against yourself and your ego. Has that played a role for you too? Do you have that group of, of women or men, but in your life who play that role? Oh yeah. I mean, I have, I have great friends in the industry, you know, peers, other entrepreneurs that get it. And we don't see each other often because we all live in different places, but they're the kind of friends that I love because I can just pick up the phone and voice text them. Even if we haven't spoken in a month yeah. and just be like, I'm going through this, like talk me off the ledge and vice versa. You know, they can come to me and it's, there's no weirdness. It's not like, Oh, you haven't checked in on me. Like it's just a different kind of relationship. And I think it's yeah. such a unique relationship to have. Like, I mean, even with Lori, like who's our mutual friend, you know, I saw Lori a couple of years ago, we spoke at an event together and then like we had dinner and it was great. And then we just like lost touch for a few months and then she popped mm -hmm. back in and emailed me. And then I emailed her. Like I value that because I think we all know, like we're so busy and we're all just trying to, you know, not only maintain our careers, but like our family lives, our personal lives or, you know, everything else that's going on. So community is really important. And I think having yeah. people who really get it. Yeah. And who are, have that grace that comes along with someone who's out there chasing really big ideas. Yeah. Yeah. I and I that. think someone, people like, you know, in our, in our space are kind of, you know, also pulled in many directions and it can be really draining sometimes as fulfilling as it is to talk to people all day and put yourself out there. It's, yeah. it's an energetic drain, you know, and not everybody understands what it's like to just maybe need to like not talk to someone all day on a Saturday. <laughs> there are moments where I'm like, stare at a wall. Yes. So I just need to stare through the TV, stare at a wall with a glass of wine in my hand and just like not talk. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's comforting not to alone. know that people get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So with you on that. Um, gosh, it's, it's so true. And again, just so grateful for women like you who are willing to be honest about what it, what it looks like, because those of you that are at, at whatever stage you're at in building toward your big dream, just know that you're not alone in feeling any of these things. If I, I can just picture so many women listening to this, nodding along, like, yep. Mm -hmm. Been there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, so good. And it's like, and as you grow, it's like a whole new set of stress, <laughs> stressors and expectations, you know, it, it changes. It's, mm -hmm. it's different in the beginning. And I, I kind of tell people like relish the time in the beginning, if you are new, because not a lot of people are watching you. So you kind of can make those mistakes and no one really cares. So but you true. know, as you, yeah, as you're out there more, there's more eyes on you. There's more at stake. There's more opinions. Like, so, you know, just honor the season you're in whatever season you're in with your business, like just honor it and be happy that you're there and be grateful and try to just take as many lessons as you can. Yeah. Oh, so well said. Okay. There was one other part of the newest book girl on fire that I wanted to touch on because this, this really, really resonated. And it was the chapter about it's never too late to be who you secretly dream of being. First of all, I love that you phrased it that way. I mean, it's never too late. We've heard that before, but the piece about 
becoming the person who you secretly dream of being. And there are, there are more women who feel that way or have that, oh, it would be cool. Wouldn't it be so cool to do X, Y, Z? Uh, so talk about why it was important to you to include that in the book. And yeah, just, I mean, there were so many great parts. I'm like, I'll, I'll just let you take it from there and share whatever you want to share. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think like just looking at my own life, there's been so many things that I've said, Oh, I wish I could do this. Or I wish I could do that. Like I dyed my hair pink a few years ago and I had like pink hair for years, but before it happened, I was like, I wish I had balls to have pink hair, you know? And I had a Pinterest board with like hundreds of pictures of strangers with pink hair. And then finally one day I was like, why don't you just do it? Like, what are you waiting for? And I did it. And it was such a moment for me. And I would have women coming up to me on the street, in the airport, at restaurants, saying, I wish I had the boss to do that. I wish I had, I wish I could have pink hair too. And I'm like, you can, you know? So I noticed this trend. And I mean, even when it comes from ever anything from pink hair, style, um, moving, right? Like how many people have said, I wish I could just go live in another city for a while, or I wish I could just quit my job and, and go write a book. And, you know, I, I know for me, like there's still things that I kind of quote secretly want to do, but I'm a little bit more vocal about them now, obviously. Yeah. But I wanted women to, to realize that you can. I mean, we really are the only ones kind of standing in our own way, like you said earlier, you know, and a lot of my clients will say things like, I'm just too old to write a book or, you know, I'm too old to start a business. That's I, It just pains me when I see women holding themselves back because of their age. You know, like I just turned 40 and I feel like I'm just getting started. Yeah. So I think we have to just put it out there. And I think when you speak about your dreams and you speak about them in a positive way, it helps move them along. It helps the right opportunities come to you because you're being honest about what you truly want. That is so true. Okay. So I'm going to put you on the spot and ask what's one thing that right now is kind of on that wish, like how oh, I wish I could, or wouldn't we call it unicorn brainstorming. So it's like a, wouldn't it be cool if what's like a crazy one that right now you're speaking into existence. So I have a vintage jewelry line and I started it like two years ago, just because I started taking classes at FIT, which is the fashion Institute of technology. I love fashion. I love style. Um, and I started selling vintage jewelry because I just, I liked it. It was fun. It was like a little side hustle passion project for me. Never really meant to become anything big. I didn't really care about making any money. It was just like a fun thing. And as I got more and more into it, I was like, I really love this. I really enjoy this. And I really have been thinking now that I want to start designing my own jewelry. And once the world opens again, I really want to start traveling. And I, I just see myself doing like pop-up events in like Paris and London and, you know, having my own line and having a store one day. And it sounds so crazy to say that I want to have a store because the economy is like, you know, going crazy. Like real estate is just like insane. Like you walk around my neighborhood in New York city right now, the stores are all just been looted. They're boarded up. I mean, I, I sound like an insane person saying I want my own store, but I know <laughs> deep down, if I say yeah. it, the universe is going to find a way to make it happen. And it's going to happen when it's supposed to, and in the right time. So that's like my fun dream. I still want to do everything I'm doing now. And I, I yeah. you know, I think, I think you can be, that's another theme in the book being multi-passionate. You know, I see myself as a creative entrepreneur, whether it's writing books, doing the podcast, you know, coaching and consulting for women, having a jewelry line. Like I just, I think we can do it all. I really do. I think maybe not all at the same time or give a hundred percent to everything. But I, I think, I don't know, the term stay in your lane, like really bothers me because I just think it's so limiting. And I think that we need to explore all the things on our heart, everything we want to explore. We're entitled to go, to go see those dreams through. Yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. If I had a glass of champagne, I would give you a virtual cheers. <laughs> virtual cheers. Virtual right cheers. Now. Okay. My water so bottle. <laughs> on that theme, what are you working on right now? That is the most exciting the jewelry. And then I know you have a new agency that you're starting. So maybe share a little bit more about that. Yeah. So the jewelry, of course, I'm working on, it's called Dagmar Rose Vintage. That's the line named after my grandmother. Um, and my agency is just launching. We actually just launched the website today officially. So I went to school for coaching. So I'm like a certified professional life coach with a specialization in wellness. I've got a master coaching certification. So for a while, I just did just straight up life coaching for years and I loved it. But I noticed that all of my clients were female entrepreneurs and the conversations were really shifting from life coaching into more of like business mindset coaching. And then it was going even a step further and I was really consulting for people. You know, I was sitting down with them and brainstorming with them on their business strategy, helping them rewrite their bio, you know, helping them really develop their personal brand. And, you know, in addition to all my experience building my brand, I have 20 years of experience in digital media, media, which makes me sound so old when I said it out loud. I was like 20 years, but I started in the music business. You know, I worked for 
you know, J records, I launched like Alicia Keys's website, you know, I, I did a lot of like really heavy, like digital marketing work. So I have a really interesting, um, like set of experiences, like in the digital space. And I love storytelling, obviously I've written nine books. So the agency is called Icon Blonde Agency. Um, and it's really for women who want to, you know, figure out what their personal brand is, figure out how they can really refine it, pivot, especially a lot of the women that I'm working with now are wanting to pivot after everything that happened with COVID-19 and they're looking for new ways to express themselves and take their businesses online and expand their, their strategy really. So that's just been super exciting. Uh, and what a beautiful way to bring this umbrella to capture all the, the multi passionate things that have been a part of your career. I love that. So, okay. Before we start to wind it up, wind this up, where is the best place for people to find the agency, the book, your blog, basically just cyber stalk you. Where's the best place? Yeah. To do that? <laughs> so if you go to the champagne diet.com, that's my main website. So from there you can find the blog, you can find my books, the podcast, all of that. Um, my podcast is called Style Your Mind, and it's on iTunes, Spotify, everywhere you listen to podcasts, and um, Instagram. I'm at The Champagne Diet on Instagram. And that's probably the best place to come hang with me because I'm on there every single day. And then from there, you can you know, link out to everything that I have going on. Okay. Oh, so good. Well, and for those of you, I know so many of you after listening are going to want to go get a copy of Girl on Fire. So here's what we'll do. If you screenshot you listening to this podcast, share something you took away. I know you took away so much, but just share one or two things and we'll gift um, five people a copy of the book. So if you want to get your hands on Girl on Fire, it's so good. Literally one of my top reads for 2020 thus far. It's oh, thank so, you, Lindsay. I appreciate it. Yes. I'm just so honored to get to spend a little bit of time with you. So we always end on this question. And I think right now, even everything that we talked about underlines why this is so important for us to be able to acknowledge for ourselves is something we like to call your powerhouse moment. Now it could be something big or small, but just a moment in the past few weeks that you are able to maybe even just first for the first time right now, look back and go, you know what I was, I was a total powerhouse in how I handled that or this result that I got, or just the way that I gave myself grace. So first thing that comes to mind, what is a powerhouse moment that you've had recently? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, there's been a few moments that I've been really proud of. I think just being able to show up for my community right now during this time um, in the world, right, with all of the racial tension, with the pandemic, with everything going on, I feel like I've done a good job at balancing my own energy so that I could be there for them. You know, when I've been in my DMs every single day, texting, voice memoing, you know, connecting with my audience. I've been in my group. I have an online membership called the Styling Your Minds Academy. We do a group coaching call every other week, showing up for them and really just listening and just trying to be a good listener, but also be a really strong leader for them at the same time. You know, especially the black women in my community who I love dearly and I've always supported. And we have, you know, such a strong relationship, really just asking them, like, what do you need from me? Like, how can I continue to support you? Um, at the same time, balancing all of it on my own, because it's, it's a lot to take in right now, you know, just watching the news and being in the news cycle. So I think just trying to maintain a positive outlook and always be forward thinking, you know, and always be able to give people something to look forward to and take action steps to ultimately empower ourselves and just make this world better because we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> Amen to that. Um, this truly was just so much fun getting to know you. I can't wait to do it again with champagne. Yes, yes for sure. <laughs> Kara, thanks so much. Thank you, Lindsay. I appreciate it. <laughs>